The west coast of Tasmania has always held true to a distinct identity which endures to this day. It's based on geography and a history of isolation from the rest of the island. The mountain ranges running down the west of Tasmania are a natural barrier to the more populated eastern regions of the island. The most recalcitrant convicts were sent to Sierra Island in Macquarie Harbour in 1822 to get them away from the southeastern settlement of Hobart. It was soon realised that the ancient timber, Huon Pine, was superior boat building material, and the convicts began logging this valuable resource. By the end of the 19th century, the West Coasters were also mining gold, copper, zinc and tin. There was no road to the East Coast from the West until 1932, and Melbourne was more familiar to the West Coasters than Hobart. When I visited Queenstown and other West Coast towns in 1974, there was still a strong feeling of being in a unique community, summed up by the expression, the West Coast spirit. The interviews I recorded then were with Hewan pioneers and miners who remembered West Coast life back almost to the turn of the 20th century. Almost everyone I interviewed in 1974 is now dead, but their memories of their beloved West Coast can still be heard. Episode 1. The West Coast Spirit. The people of Queenstown on the west coast of Tasmania are literally dancing in the streets. It's the night of Monday the 23rd of August 1978. The whole town is celebrating the news that the federal government will subsidise the Mount Lyle Company's copper mine for a further 21 months, to the tune of $7.5 million. It's effectively saved the town of some 5,000 people and their jobs. For the Mount Lyle Company is Queenstown, and the low world copper prices have put the operation at risk. It's not the first crisis the town has weathered, nor will it be the last. All mining towns must eventually close down, but not yet. And the Queenstowners are rejoicing in their new lease of life. Always be a grace of the federal government has kept the Mount Lyles Queenstown operation afloat and only an upturn in the world's copper prices can keep their processing of the immense deposits of low-grade ore profitable again. It was the West Coast's large magnetite iron ore deposits that caused the compass needles of the Dutch navigator and explorer Abel Tasman to swing wildly as the gales of the roaring 40s blew his ships Heemskirk and Zeehan towards the west coast of Tasmania in 1642. Two days before sighting land, he noted in his log that there might be mines of lodestone about here. More than 200 years were to pass before the mineral riches that swayed Tasman's compasses were to be exploited, as well as the timber in the rainforests that choked the plains and gullies surrounding the jagged, white quartzite-tipped mountains that characterise the west coast. The area presents a forbidding prospect. The roaring forties lash its rocky coasts with unremitting ferocity. The rainfall can top 150 inches a year. The only convenient port on the coast, Macquarie Harbour, has a narrow, dangerous entrance, appropriately called Hell's Gates. The first European settlement on the west coast was the infamous convict station on Settlement Island in Macquarie Harbour, established in 1822, surely one of the most miserable and remote jails ever built. The convicts began to fell the famous Huon Pine, one of the world's best boat-building timbers. The discovery of tin, copper and some gold attracted mining operations in the late 1800s. By the turn of the century, the Mount Lyle Company alone employed about 3,000 men, and thriving population centres included Zeehan, Linda, Strawn, 
Gormanston, Williamsford and Waratah. But the West Coast remained a very isolated area. There was the port of Strawn and Macquarie Harbour, and the only other way in or out was the rail link to the northwest of the island. Indeed, there was no road link with the east coast of Tasmania and the capital Hobart until as late as 1932. I've lived on the West Coast all my life and developed a great respect for the West Coast people because I felt they were different from the rest of the Tasmanians. They're strange people who have great independence and people of considerable initiative. Uh, they're tough and rough, but they've got an innate gentleness in them and uh, curious respect for authority in many ways. Of course, that, all those sort of things are changing now, no doubt. But they were the sort of people that you could never drive, but they were very easily led. They were hospitable excellent with women. Uh, I find it very hard too, to find them, but they were quite unlike the general run of Tasmanians. And if you accuse them of being Tasmanians, they say certainly not, they were West Coasters. Their affinities are much closer or were much closer with Victoria than they were with Tasmania. And primarily, of course, because until more recent uh, times, their only means of outlet was by seas and straw. And all their supplies came from Victoria. And, uh, well, as a matter of interest today, the, the national broadcasting system in the West Coast doesn't broadcast Tasmanian races. For any Tasmanian sporting events, the Victorian programs come through 7QM. The beer no longer comes from Victoria, it comes by road from Hobart, so in that respect, they're Tasmanians. It's something that's hard to explain to those who haven't lived on the West Coast. Until fairly recent times, West Coast people who lived on their own had to survive and grow up, live and survive, as I say, in their own surroundings. And uh, although in mining fields, some of the mining fields, there were different groups, the bosses wouldn't be associated with the working men, perhaps, but if tragedy happened to any family, if someone was killed, or some home was burnt out, which was not infrequent, you'd find that the whole of the community in that area would bind together to support that family. To anyone who came there, they wouldn't think there could be any difference in the family who had lost their, their dear one, or dear ones, or their home, than anybody else, because you wouldn't uh, recognise it. They'd be set up, to start again, and uh, that, that's what I call the West Coast spirit, perhaps, the uh, sense of an affinity of the outlook on life. He's one of us, therefore he has to survive and we will do what we can to help him. There was nothing spectacular about it, but it was uh, just a, a fact of life that possibly is hard to explain to uh, anyone who doesn't understand this or hasn't ever to live there. You see, they lived there for the whole of their lives, there, many of the old people, and didn't go anywhere else. They knew everybody else around them, and in many respects they were all one big family, a big family of people or a community of people put it that way. Some of them were big human beings, were hard drinkers. Some of them were pretty dirty, pretty filthy perhaps, didn't have much idea of hygiene. But by the same token, they were decent human beings. They did what they could to make the best of circumstances in which they found themselves. Until the roads came, if you knocked at any door, in the place in, in morning tea time, afternoon tea, or any meal time, you, you would in, insult them if you didn't have a cup of tea or go on. And there was never any locks on any houses. You could go in and uh, you're expected, if you were hungry, to get yourself a food, leave a note, and put some more wood back to light the fire the next time. And that went on till the last World War, just Second World War. I think it developed from the prospect as they walked in and all their camps were free and everyone else come and they left their houses free. There isn't any doubt about there being that sort of a spirit. You're welcome for two or three reasons. One is that it might be my turn next to be wanting to get some shelter. And the other is that you know, it was the only way you got news and you talked about things and you got company. That's important. Three West Coasters talking about what's known as the West Coast spirit. 
First, Jeff Hudspeth, a former general manager of the Mount Lyell Company. Then, Bob Thomas, a lifelong timber man. And George Smith of Zeehan, who's now in his 80s. I asked Jeff Hudspeth about the people who came to the West Coast originally. By far the majority were Australians. See, they came down in the late 1880s and the 1890s when conditions in Australia were very rough and tough. There was great financial depression, and these men came seeking work. But with them, there was a useful sprinkling of Irishmen and Cornishmen, and they have left their mark on the West Coast. There are a great many Irish names and quite a lot of Cornish names on the West Coast and in the mining fields. There are many mining terms which have a direct uh, connection with Cornwall. For example, uh, at Mount Lyle, every miner underground had a little hatchet, had a hammer head on one side and a blade on the other. And most people would call it a hatchet, but not the Mount Lyle miners. They called it a beldag, B-E-L-D-A-G. That's a Cornish term. And the beldag was never bought in any shop. It had to be made by a blacksmith. There were dozens of Cornish terms, but uh, that's how they originated. They were the refugees from the depressions of the 1890s. And uh, they walked in, in most cases, because there were no railways into that district until nearly 1900. So uh, they did it the hard way. When they got there, they were virtually isolated, except from the, the railway to the northwest coast. There was no road link with Hobart. Uh, How did this affect their community life? It affected it very materially. They were there in considerable numbers. By 1900, Queenstown must have had a population of 6,000, I suppose. But they were completely isolated. There was a railway by then to Strawn, and uh, no connection from there on to Zeehan until some years later. So that... They had walked in, and yet they found themselves in a large community. And they became very close-knit. They developed their own customs and their own interests, and they intermarried. And the communities themselves were tight little communities. The Queenstowners had no opportunity to mix with the Zeonites. The people of Zeon would not have known the people of Waratah. So that the Zeon people developed their own particular interests and customs, and the Queenstown people did likewise. Queenstown happened to be a somewhat larger community in that it had the other second town of Gormson, four miles away, and the port of Strawn. It was a larger community with perhaps a little wider interests. Probably that's the reason that Queenstown survived so long. It was a big enough community to stand on its own feet and the weather, the various vicissitudes of fortune that hit the Mount Lyle Company. In 1951, at the age of 20, Geoffrey Blaney, who's now Ernest Scott Professor of History at Melbourne University, went to Queenstown to work for the Mount Lyle Company and to research his book, The Peaks of Lyle. It wasn't as isolated then in the early 1950s as it had been 30 or 60 years earlier, but it was very isolated. Uh, in, in the daytime, you couldn't get any anything. Oh, I certainly couldn't get anything on my wireless except the Queenstown radio station. When the bus arrived from Hobart and Launceston at three or four in the afternoon with the daily papers, that was considered a great event and there were always people waiting there to meet it. Most of the people there felt acutely isolated, I think, and and many of them rejoiced in their isolation. They said it was terrible when the road came through and linked up the West Coast to the rest of Tasmania. The older people there believed that it was a special society, that there was a West Coast spirit, that the West Coast was like nowhere else on earth and that special quality had to be preserved. No doubt it had a special quality in the pioneering days, the 1880s and the 1890s. Uh, The special quality was still there in the 1950s, but it was much diminished. You often hear talk of the West Coast spirit. While you were living there, did you feel that there was a West Coast spirit? Well, it was different. Uh, You know, there were were so many customs which must have existed once in the rest of Australia that had, had vanished and those customs were still flourishing on the West Coast, uh, but the spirit, whatever it was, was nowhere near as strong as it must have been once. People used to say it was a very hospitable society. Well, people were hospitable in public, but they weren't in private. You'd be lucky to be invited. You had to be there for some years before you were invited into the house of a a traditional West Coaster. 
at the same time they were very warm hearted uh, when they met you in public or a public place in a hall or a hotel or a football ground. They didn't invite you home. I don't mean that to disparage them. In the 1880s and the 1890s, everyone helped one another. It was so isolated that they would do whatever they could. They'd build one another's huts or houses. They'd lend one another food. Though, of course, you know, even in my time, they were very good to anyone in need. They'd take round a hat and give money to somebody who'd lost a relative underground or in some kind of an accident. You know, it was a, certainly a very generous society. You know, a lot of money they gave away to all kinds of causes. They had a very interesting custom there that I noticed it quite often. I didn't know how general it was, but if somebody had lost a relative, maybe underground or maybe in a road accident or just died through old age, uh, they'd go up and just shake them by the hand. You know, they'd shake a relative by the hand. They never said anything, which I thought was a very sensible way of approaching things. I don't know whether that was universal, but I noticed it again and again. It's been said that in the early days, the respective communities evolved different customs that the way people lived in Gormanston might differ from Queenstown and again from Zien or Linda. Did you find any evidence of this? Well, Queenstown and Gormanston were only about four miles apart. There was, as you know, a big ridge of land between them. But I remember reading an account in a newspaper in 1912 of a miner's funeral. And the miner lived in Queenstown, but he worked in the mines where a lot of Gormanston people worked. And uh, the Gormanston people came down to Queenstown for the funeral. And the newspaper report said that Queenstown had a strange appearance uh, last Wednesday or Thursday because the town was full of people who obviously came from the West Coast but were completely unfamiliar with (laughs) their ways and their manners from the people of Queenstown, only four miles apart. You see, Gormanston was a mining town. Most of the men in Gormanston worked underground or in the open cut. Queenstown was a town for woodcutters and men who worked in the smelters. They had different occupations and I suppose that helped to make the towns different in many ways. I know an old clergyman said to me, even as late as 1920, that they celebrated Sunday in a completely different way in Queenstown compared to Gormanston. You know, in Gormanston it was an open day. In Queenstown, you know, quite a proportion of people would go to church, you know, no no sport or very little sport on Sunday in Queenstown. I think Zeehan, in many ways, was a very different town to Queenstown. I think Zeehan was a very religious town compared to Queenstown or Gormanston. George Smith's father brought his family to Zeehan in 1900. I asked him about living conditions at that time, what their house was like, and what amenities it had. Yes, we didn't have amenities in those days. There was no bathroom. Your bath was a a tub which Mother used for washing. The houses were lined with flip tailings, a scrim or hessian lining with mostly newspapers for wallpaper. I remember that there was no light colours in those days. All the houses were painted dark brown or very dark colours. Nothing gaudy like there is now. No contrasting colours. Food was plentiful. It was cheap, but it was pretty plain. Was vegetables were very scarce in this area. It's in. Fruit was a luxury you saw sometimes. It's like poultry in those days. You always had a a fowl down the backyard that you cut, cut his head off, off for Christmas or Easter. And you had, that's about when you got fruit too, a couple of times a year. So what was the main diet? Bread and meat, potatoes. I learned to live on those and that's, I'm quite happy if that's all the food that's about now. And if you had sauce, you, it was mainly to disguise the tainted meat. Sauce was a luxury. There was no such thing as having butter on bread and then put jam or something else on top of that. You either had one or the other. Those wages were seven and six a day. It used to take a day's pay to buy a pair of boots for dad, and about the same rate as it does now. Socks were a shilling a pair, woolen socks. Suits were three pounds ten. Only half a week's pay. How many were in the family? Two then, but we ended up with nine at the finish. I've got uh, three brothers and five sisters. What sort of a life was it for your mother? Well, all women, uh, (coughs) very few married women worked. As a matter of fact, if they had a family, they had a full-time job. It's 
the wrestling was a whole day event and they in this climate they take days to get the clothes dry and the time they were ironed they, they were busy they had much more cooking to do and it was all on open fires or colonial ovens stoves were just about to come in camp ovens hanging over an open fire there was no labor saving devices the floors had to be scrubbed the carpets were scarce Matter of fact, most homes that I knew in those days only had sack bags on the floor for where there was a carpet. My mother was a very good provider who didn't have much of the world's goods, but she was a magnificent cook and made the best and most of what was available to her. I had a very happy life. I never wore a pair of boots on my feet until I was nine years of age. And uh, as a result of that, I've got good feet, never had any corns or bunions. I used to run about the streets in Rosebury. At the weekend, my brother and I would go along the railway line and catch snakes for, uh, for a pastime. With bare feet, I was always cranky. A young and cranky then, but an old and not so cranky now, perhaps. But uh, we enjoyed doing this, and as I say, we had a very happy childhood there. I went to school, did very well, loved my school. My brother hated it. Because of our circumstances and because of the conditions that was in at, and at Rosebury, life was a struggle for us when the mine was defunct. So I couldn't, my parents couldn't afford to send me to high school. I had to go out to work. And I found that possibly life has been the best educator since then. My father usually had a number of men working for him. And because the conditions were hard there, <clears throat> he was soft-hearted and men took advantage of him. Mr. Men managed to come. My mother used to provide food for these men. And my father would buy the hut in which the men would camp and live. And in many instances, they would take us down. Unfortunately, my mother was, and my father both were too good-hearted to become well off. What they had, they divided amongst their family and amongst people who were working, and, and the people in and around us too. I can remember when conditions were terribly difficult for Zian. My mother used to bake bread for a whole lot of families. I used to distribute this around the place to them too. Our local baker was a very sick man and he became so sick he couldn't he couldn't bake bread. And uh, my mother supplied bread via the old camp oven and the old Peter's oven too to a great deal of the residents in Rosebury. As I was as when I was a child, I used to take this bread around and I an old bed basket hanging on my arm. I can just see it now, long ago as it was. I didn't think about it then. It was just a matter of uh, a matter of course to me. It never occurred to me that it was something very special. But looking back on them, I realised that it was. My mother was a very high, a very high moral standards. The women must have been every bit as hardy as the men. I can remember one dear old lady who lived in Zion. I used to enjoy talking to. She uh, was an old Mrs. Moyle. And in her latter days, she lived at the Central Hotel with her son and daughter-in-law. They were the proprietors of the hotel. And quite often after a meal in the Central Hotel, I would go up to Mrs. Moyle's little sitting room and find the dear old lady sitting there in a black skirt, white crochet blouse, with a thin velvet band round her neck and a shawl over her head. And she was a true gentlewoman, gentle little old lady with a great fund of stories of the early days of Zion. And uh, a very accurate memory, I would think. She never told me the same story twice. And when you questioned her, she didn't change the details. So she knew what she was talking about. Now, the point of this is that you asked me whether the women were tough. She claimed to be the first female on the West Coast. She walked in with her father at the age of four, was her claim. Now, the original Moyle set off from Smithton, apparently, and came down the west coast of Tasmania to Zion, bringing his family. And if you think of that journey, there's some quite big rivers. They'd have to swim the Arthur River for a start, swim the Pyman. And they made their way down to Zion, and she was at the age of four when she did it. Now, I would think that in one respect, the story is probably inaccurate. I imagine that he had pack horses, and a child of four would 
why. But nevertheless, the uh, dear old lady had got there at the age of four, which after a trip, which I should imagine had taken at least a fortnight, you know, to get down that coast. My uh, mother, when she was married, came to live in Gormanson. She'd come from the soft climate of the Western District of Victoria into the exceedingly harsh surroundings of Gormanson. And her only means of getting out of that town, even to Queenstown, was by a coach and four horses. I can remember some of the tales that she used to tell. For a start, all the children in Gormanson, the babies were carried by their mothers on a peculiar contraption, which you don't see at all these days, a plank about two feet long and about 12 inches wide with a hollow cut in one side and a strap and the hollow fitted over the mother's hip and the strap went over her shoulder and the baby sat with a leg either side of his mother's body and they liked them all around the country that way. And there was a little town up at North Lyle to which there was no road and uh, quite a lot of mothers lived up there and they walked the three miles from North Lyle carrying their babies that way. Every time there wasn't even a reel of cotton. So they were happy, all right. Episode 2, Logging, Hue and Pie. The realisation that the West Coast contained one of the best and most long-lasting timbers in the world, particularly for boat building, came even before the mineral potential of the area was known. Hue and Pine, as it became known, only grows in certain areas on the West Coast. Its pale yellow aromatic timber is practically impervious to rot. It's also very slow growing, with trees taking hundreds of years to reach maturity. Convicts sent to Settlement Island in 1822 began felling and using the timber. And although the bulk of the timber has been since cut out, it's still in demand today. Bob Crane of Strawn is presently seeking hue and pine in areas he first worked in as a stable boy, working horse teams with his father. I'm working in the same area. I started off there when I was 14. I got this job of cooking a stable boy and went to Pine Cove and after the drafts there, sort of knocking up a bit of a feed for the horse bugs. And then uh, Dad come down to go boss horse driver. So I worked there. I started off at what was it? Uh, Ten bob a week and me keep. It's cooking the stable boy. Then... I eventually ended up as driving three horses and getting 30 bob a week. That's three dollars a week and the uh, keep. So uh, I thought I was made in the days. Oh, what a ripper turned out. Making all that money. It was good to bring some money over because things were tough in them times. That was about 40 years ago. I remember when I was a kid, we used to go down to the wharf and we'd watch loading horses onto the lighters. And the bushmen are all be getting ready, having their last few beers and up and rubbing one thing or another before they head it off. Oh, it was like a big carnival. Everybody would be, I don't know, want to be heading off to the bush for five or six months, but they'd be as happy as Larry. And the kids would all be around thinking, oh, gee, I'd like to be going to the bush with them, you know, and that sort of thing. Seeing all these big, Magnificent horses getting loaded aboard the light. That was a, a thing on its own, you know, you'd like to see them scrambling aboard and that sort of thing. Uh, you don't seem the same sort of things these days, do you? Like when we go down there, all the boys would get around, watching these, buying the bigger sources. A few lucky ones like yourself going? Yes, yes, the young fellows. When you first headed off to the bush, you reckon you was great. Got your dungarees, your long dungarees and boots. What they used to call the Gordon Ripper special boot. You had uh, long cut nails so they scrambled around the bush and wouldn't slip on the logs. They'd cut into the log, dig in. They all used to be handmade. You can't get them these times. Pretty young fellows, when they had their first trip into the river, they... I reckon it was 
we're all good. But they didn't go much on when they come back out again six months later. <laughs> Especially a bit of a hard winter, isn't it? You worked every day unless you was got the flu or was cook or something. If you was a bushman, you worked every day. If you were a horse driver, you worked six days a week and your seventh day was the day off for shoeing horses and looking after your harvest and repairs and whatever, you know, like that. Actually, you was paid all the time you was there, like your seven days. But you didn't get no overtime or anything like that. It was just one rate of pay. We worked seven days a week, every day. Winter and summer, yes. In that area on the West Coast, whether you're in the line of the Roaring Forties, you get a continual rainfall. The forests are wet all the time. Many times, I'd go out of, out of my bunk, have my breakfast, go down to the river, jump into the river, hold the water, build up over the rapids and, until you have a bit of quiet water and row again. Just on the next rapid, row again. Up to, you know, walk about three feet of water until you've got too deep to walk. You hop into the boat and start to row then, of course. And did this for months and months on end. I never thought about it. What was the dress? What did you wear? This was a very good question. It was a common thing. A pair of dungaree pants, no underpants, a waverly flannel inside your pants, and another waverly flannel outside, a second waverly flannel on top. I never had a coat all the time on the West Coast, never owned a coat. We, we, no one would ever think about having a raincoat because you couldn't work in one. But because you had two flannels, because they were well, very well made, good quality woolen flannel, that would keep you warm. It would get wet, but that still keep you warm. And the overall flannel, you never washed. And the nap on it, the, the little hairs, would collect the water and they'd run off. You would get wet through in the course of a very wet day, but you never got cold, fuel. And if to dry the over flannel or any of them, they hang them up in the fireplace. The chimney's a big wide chimney on end of each camp. And the whole of one end reserved for a chimney place. You could get in and sit alongside the fire. You hang your flannels up there to dry and they'd smoke. And they'd be more wet waterproof. But you don't do that nowadays. I couldn't stand the feel of a flannel like that now on the bare skin. The outside flannel, he was never ever washed. He'd be hung up in the chimney and smoked. Yeah. <laughs> You stunk like a fireplace, you know. But he'd turn the water. You could put him on, and, and no matter how hard it rained, it would turn the water, and he was always nice and warm. You didn't have a lot of clobber. You took your two of his pairs of dungarees and his flannels and plenty of socks, with woody socks. You'd always have to have two or three pairs of working boots. We used to wear a pair of bowie hangs. We all used to wear those below our knees. But when we were walking up over the rapids, we'd take those off because the water would have to run out through our pants. If it didn't, it bulged out like a couple of balloons on your legs with the water above your bowie hangs. So we, we didn't, uh, didn't wear bowie hangs when we walked in the rapids. Quest for Hugh and Pine was a tough, wet, cold and often lonely job. Yet this timber had and continues to have a fascination for those who have anything to do with it. Bob Crane has been cutting and milling Hugh and Pine for 40 years. There's no timber in the world just like your Pine. It's so easy to work, so good to work and such a beautiful timber to look at. When you're working in the yawn pine bush, you never ever seem to end up with any aches or pains or crook or anything, flues or anything. I don't know what it is, whether it's the pine oil or smell you get when you cut a tree down, you know. Uh, the fumes, with a cut them with a chainsaw, and they throw the sawbust back all over, you know. And the fumes will nearly choke you. That's strong. Whether that keeps the germs away from your witnesses, I don't know, probably. Uh, powerful. After a while, it sort of loses all that real strong smell, but never ever loses it altogether. 
yes, you know, boys are wonderful people. They haven't got anything in the world anywhere to match it, anywhere near it. Many of the logs we got were logs we were referred to as downers. This West Coast country has only got a shallow amount of soil, and certain cyclones would tear through the, the forest or the gorge, wherever the timber was, would cut a swathe through the forest and knock everything down this path. And because they had no tap roots, everything would go down. And quite frequently, you'd find that these logs were down, these pine logs, amongst others, and because it was long lived in there, it would survive, and other trees would go over the top of it. On one occasion, you may find this hard to believe, but this is a fact. We had some students from the, the Forest University at Canberra. They came to on a part of the hue and pine, and there was a solid top pine growing on a downer hue and pine. I was getting this thing off, the, cutting the roots off the celery top pine. One of these chaps said to me, would you cut a ring off it, off the celery top pine? I said, I'll do that, yes. Which I did. He said to have counted the rings on the celery top pine, found it was 300 years old. That'll give you an instance of how old uh, the, this timber can, how long it can last and how old it really can live. I will firmly believe that uh, many of those trees are growing there when Christ was on this earth, you and pines, that found trees which actually over 2,000 years old, or well, to be over 2,000 years old. And uh, I can well understand this because I've counted rings on a sapling, say, nine inches in diameter, and the ring growths were so close together, they were extremely difficult to count. I've stopped marking them with a shun pencil or something like this to count them, and a uh, nine inch thing would be up to 300 years old. I have to admit to a personal fascination with the West Coast, not to mention hue and pine. When I met Bob Crane in Strawn, I was most interested to find that he was logging areas he first worked in as a boy, and he took me into the area. We first drove up a section of the old railway line that used to connect Queenstown with its port, Strawn. And then in a four-wheel drive truck, we headed up the most unbelievable grades to reach, in a matter of hours, the slopes and gullies that men and horses had taken weeks to reach, and had then stayed out for up to six months at a time. We're standing in an area that's been logged how many years before for human? At least 40 years ago this was logged. Probably a little bit over that. Because when I worked here as a boy, that would be 40 years ago. This would be cut before then, these logs. So we're uh, looking at what they left behind? Yes. Which is the, the head of the tree. This is the head of one of the trees, yeah. It just looks like an, an old decaying stump. You wouldn't look twice at it if you didn't know what you were looking for. That's right, yes, yes. But uh, you see where they've cut it off there with a cross-cut saw? Now, that's as solid as the day they cut it off. Eh? Hey? Look at that. Beautiful. Now, about half an inch in, it's just beautiful, beautiful. yellow, sweet-smelling human pine. Mm. To a very distinctive smell. That's right. Well, will you make use of this? Oh, uh, yes, yes. That's got a beautiful log. Drop there. Oh. Drop there. 15, 16 foot. Beautiful. Beautiful log out of that. See, they only took the best to barrel the log in those, those times. Just to, They wouldn't touch anything like that because uh, they had to pull it so far with horses and they could get the real, you know, the good stuff right out of the heart of the tree. And we can take all this sort of stuff now because there's so much wood turning goes on. That's beautiful timber, wood turning. Furniture your timber, yes, yeah, beautiful. People are always saying that hue and pine's gone, that its days are numbered. Now, you're in here commercially milling hue and pine, moving into areas that have been logged 50, 60 years That's ago. That's right. Well, what's your opinion of that? Oh, well, as you can see yourself, the hundreds of trees has been left behind, poked away in corners and that. You and pine, in my opinion, will never be, uh, you hear a lot of them say it, it'll be extinct in a few years' time, there'll be no more of it left. As you can see yourself, there's millions of young pines growing up here where it's been logged over years ago. And still, all sizes of pine which has been left, Accepting that the new ones will take hundreds of years to grow, because that's how they grow. Oh, that's right. How yeah. long could you keep on working this area, do you think? Oh, 20 years at least. Logging it like this, taking these old heads and one thing or another, and trees which left standing. But even then, they'll be 
hundreds of trees. Oh, foot to two what are you you've seen some of the big old fellows what you don't even bother with. You leave them behind, uh, young trees up to a foot, eighteen inches through, you don't touch them. They'll all be still here as well as the little fellow what's grown up all the time. But had a, a lovely perfume, which probably you are aware of traditional hue and fine, it's a, an aroma quite distinct from any of any other timber. And it's a very long lived timber. As, a, as an instance of this, I would refer to you the fact that a settlement island had a complete settlement there. And sometimes we're in a, in a difficult position, we'd run across from the Gordon River into settlement island to lay there and have a rest on certain weather conditions. And uh, I saw this old landing. Boat landing where they, the, the early uh, uh, convicts were, and they had logs secured down in the water up onto the rocks for what they call a boat slip. Well, they'd slip their boats, uh, bring them ashore to build them and repair them and run them down the slip into the water. These logs were hewn pine. They left there in 1825, that's the convicts, and uh, so good is this timber, and so long lived, lived is it. There were, although there was moss on the log, which well, you could scrape the moss off, well, the timber was just as good. Not only that, but it had this distinct aroma in it. And they're, they're still there for anyone to see, which is quite a, a remarkable thing. Also, the earlier people who went to the Gordon River used to go in there in boats, sailing boats, with a, a load of stones for ballast. When they go into the, into the Gordon River and the calmer waters of the mouth of the Gordon River, they'd unload the stone. Now send their gangs up the Gordon River to tall trees, what they call the billabongs. And they used to cut these through the big billets with an old fashioned pig tooth saws. And I've seen these, the outside pieces off the logs. And they'd take those all over the world, to England and anywhere, anywhere they can dispose of them those times, because the timber was even then was realised to be so valuable. It's impervious to the the borer, the uh, the Yes. Trado, yes, it is. Yes. And that's why it's so valuable for a boat. It's a wonderful thing, the boys, when you can look at it as not because I cut trees down or anything like that. To the, to look at the bush, oh, it's beautiful. You see it early in the morning, sun come up over the mountains back there. The mist rising out of the gullies. Ah, there's something about it. You can look down on that other side down there. You can see way down the bottom end of the harbour. See Settlement Island, where they had the convicts there. Birches in it. See miles of birches in it. It looked like, just like a river. And then you look this other way and you see the mountains all going, Queenstown and Zane Way. Beautiful. You know, to remind me, when I was here years and years ago, I can just picture, you know, it just comes back to me. Dad with his, that big team of horses, five horses, hooked onto a big human pine, a big log with about 15 or 1,600 super feet in it. Going up that, scrambling up that beach, sending the stones flying from their feet, scrambling on the jingle, the chains and everything, you know, oh, gee, it was wonderful see that sort of thing you can just picture it you know five beautiful big drafts shiny and this great big yawn fine log behind them and the stones flying and the chains rattling uh, i don't know Episode 3, Getting the Pine Out. It was terribly hard country. Very difficult indeed. It was, uh, looking back on it, it was almost incredible the things we used to do there and expect others to do too. Because chaps who came here looking for jobs were virtually completely inexperienced. And I put them on to do cut timber in the bush usually had a good horse driver, except who was experienced, but because the horses had to be fed wholly with chaff, oats and bran, it was a very hard life for those. And we used to have to shoe them ourselves, so I used to have to shoe the horses there, and 
if they had a horse driver who could do it, he would do it. If he, if he couldn't or wouldn't, I used to have to do it. And I'd get crippled. One occasion we had a horse. We were taking this instance log down a very steep incline. The log shot forward and caught the heel of the rear horse of three and chopped his hop almost off. And uh, I wanted to shoot this horse, but the kind-hearted driver didn't want to do that. He put him in a sling and kept him in a sling for three months, hoping he'd be able to walk him out of it. But he didn't. He died there eventually, so we should have done this in the first place. Would have been uh, kinder, I think, looking back on it. I saw many horses get killed, die there. I, th I suppose in those times, it was, this is a long while ago now, of course, but people didn't have the attitude towards life they do now. If it got hurt, we'd take it for granted. It'd be, uh, if he survived, it'd be well and good. If he didn't, well, we couldn't help it. And the same with horses. Horses all become injured, and very often they'd have to cut their throat to get, to get dispose of them so they wouldn't suffer, because we knew they, they couldn't recover. Did you ever eat them? Not ever. No, we couldn't eat a horse. I wouldn't eat a horse. I suppose we would if we were desperate. But we, we weren't quite so desperate as that. Did they ever use bullocks in the area? Well, Crane's father had bullocks in Strawn. The only one I know of, too, in Strawn. He did a lot of work with them, but they're usually mainly up the, along the line to get celery logs, as far as I remember. I think he mentioned that they had a horse leading a bullet team down there. That's right. I've never seen that before. I had a little black stallion. The first time I remember his grandfather, old man Crane had these bullocks and he brought timber down to put in the channel that runs across under the street. It's, now I think it's concrete pipe, but then it was wooden culvert. And he used to go into the Hamer's Hotel. It wasn't Amos then, it was Cordell's Hotel. And the black stallion go in with him, follow him in and drink beer. They, the last I heard of that stallion was the bullocks. They had two bullocks. Redmond was one of them. Another one was a big poly bull that they'd castrated. Strawberry bull, strawberry colour. <coughs> and this stallion used to work with those two. And his uncle, Gordon Crane, had the two, the stallion and the, these two bullocks down at Virtue's Inlet, but never in the Gordon that I know of. Have you ever heard of horses working with bullets? Not before. In the early days, my grandfather had a bullet team. When he shifted from there to Strawn, and worked bullets here in the timber industry, Logan, he had a horse. And uh, he used to work up in the leader as, uh, as a leader in of the bullet team. And uh, whenever he went off, talked to us about it. dreadful unusual for a horse to work with a bullet team like that. And I don't know of anyone or anybody else ever may have done. But this horse, he was a sort of a pet. They could do anything with him. And anyway, I remember Dad saying one time, him and his brother was logging down Birch's in the way down on the bottom end of Macquarie over there. The weather was rough and they couldn't, the supply boat couldn't get down for rough weather. And they was out of food. Living on spud peels and one thing or another, they'd heave down and they'd go and scrape them up to uh, make a bit of a stew of us out of them. But Kelly Basin was, there was a few people left at Kelly Basin, loggers and one thing or another after the, the line had closed down. So we decided to, the only way they could get a bit of food was to, you had to swim the horse, ride the horse, swim it across a place in the Birches in the cold and narrows, telling on behind the horse, and he swam from one hanging onto his tail like the other side, and then rode him round, way around to the Gordon mouth, and then he had to swim across the Gordon there, and had a fair bit of running there too. Swim across there, and then walk the horse around, ride him around, swim various bays, you know, some place you couldn't ride him all the way, and swim out around the logs and rubbish and that. We went into Kelly Basin to get food. Well, once he got there, well, he could get the boat to sneak around in close in shore around the shoulder tent of the harbour there to get the supplies back to the camp. So they done it pretty hard. The logs were taken to Pine Cove. They were sneaked down to Pine Cove by horses. They do one, one trip a day, about four to five miles from this camp. Up. From the camp into the bush were another mile and a mile and a half, sometimes two miles. And it was 
I mean, rather rough country, of course. We used to fall a tree, we'd trip it up, all the bark off it, and we'd trip it somewhat like a boat, so that each end of the tree was off the ground. I fastened this log onto a, what we call dogs, chain with a dog at each end of it, on the front of the log, and an iron shoe under the log, and the horse was set off, take this log down to Pine Cove. Because the timber was soft, and because the, uh, the stones were terribly hard, the log would lose six inches in diameter in that trip. And the, a log shoe would last only six weeks. It would all happen six weeks because of the extreme hardness of the rock. And that, you see pieces of steel on the, cut off along these rocks. And some places, they took up hills, we have to put what they call uh, logs down for the logs to slide over across the track. Corduroy would call that. But mostly it was, we'd drag the logs down the streams. we walk up through about three feet of water, and the logs would come down the spellies, except sometimes they'd get off or out of a creek into a rock on the side. These rocks, by the way, were mostly made of a kind of conglomerate and uh, patches of very hard pieces of rock inside this conglomerate. Quartzite and red and all sorts of colours they were, but uh, extremely hard. And this was the nature of the West Coast country. Because it's a mining area, you know, it's a, it's a mineral belt. Then uh, we'd get enough logs down at, at Pine Cove to make a raft, put them into a raft, they'd be towed to Strawn, and the best of those logs would be shipped overseas to Sydney mostly to make and supply boat boards for high class lodges to all wealthy people. That's some beautiful horses, I reckon. Beautiful working horses. They're going to be. Fine drafts. How many working in a team? Well, I've seen up to six in a team. Six big drafts. They'd pull around about 2,000 super feet of pine in the load, in a log. To see a team of horses working as five or six horses working as one in a team. Oh, it was beautiful. Pulling these big logs. You always had to have a good leader. A team was no good without a leader. And then you meet the horses there and know they were what was what. And the shoe horse, well, he, what was called, he was the last one in the team and he used to, on a corner, would have been, all the other horses would be pulling ahead of him, the log behind him, he'd be drug up in a sharp corner. Well, he had to lay out to it and take the whole load around. Sometimes on his own stomach, he can go from getting pulled into the bank or anything like that. The shoe horse, he mostly was a, the biggest horse of the lot, strong. Most likely, yeah. the brood of horse would probably kick your eye out if you could. But uh, they all had their job, and they all seemed to know the place in the team when you'd go to, out of the stable in the morning, they'd automatically go straight into the place in, in the team to be harnessed up. If we can get a picture of these team pulling, now they'd have to go uphill and then eventually down. Now, when the log started to move, what, what did the horses do? Were they trying to step aside and let the log run between them, or what happened? Well, on a downhill, oh, no, no. Well, if, if uh, a steep hill, sometimes we always have what's called a rough chain. You'd put a chain around the middle of the log, and that'd sort of bite into the ground, see? That'd stop them from going real fast. The horses, they'd get that cut and they'd go down quietly ahead just while the log was sort of coming along, pulling sort of business. But as soon as their chains went slack, like as if the log was shooting up on them, they'd start to run, see? And in some places they'd be going full gallop to keep out of the way of that log. Because as soon as the log stopped running and eased up, they'd just ease up with them, they wouldn't keep galloping full forward. But they had to know what to do, and many a time you'd reckon they're going to get run over the big log, camera right on the machine, and run up over the shoe chain and unhook, and they'd be scrambling, getting out of the way of it. What were the main cause of accidents with the horses, and the log running them down? Most of it, yeah. They'd get cut across the back of the legs with the shoe, or get all the chains all tangled around their legs, and one thing and another horse would let them drag them, sort of business. But they got pretty cunning to it. Matter of fact, some of them got that cunning that take off, well, especially the logger. <laughs> no, look, Luke, some of them, you can be yelling that way till they keep on going. 
Oh. <laughs> they have the log. I reckon that's right. They was good to look after. I used to love looking after the horses. I remember Dad came up from uh, this particular place where we was working in Spring Creek in the garden. He came up for 10 days each time for a spell. And I was looking after, I wasn't long, I was looking after the two teams and laying cords along a boggy place in the road. A lot of the cords were broken up. I was doing that in my spare time after, you know, let the horses out. They'd gallop around all over the place. And I had them shined up that way. They'd come back from straw. He went into the stable to have a look at the horses. And I remember he said, God, what have you done to them? And I thought, oh, gee, what's happened? You know, I thought, oh, geez, I've done something wrong. And he said, ah, oh, he said, they look beautiful. He said, God almighty, he said, look at the dapples on them. You know, they're shone on they're great big dapples shone out on them. They look real beautiful. Oh, is that please? Yes, it was good. But you can't see that with a bulldozer. He don't look nice at all. <laughs> Not the same way, do they? Episode 4, Surviving in the Bush. Go to the bush after Christmas, stop out at Easter. I'd come home at Easter for about nine, ten days at the most. Then I'd go back to the bush and stop out at Christmas time again. I had two trips a year out of the bush in about seven years down there. Not at Pine Cove so much, but later on, and up the Gordon River, was much far more isolated, I used to make a loaf of bread every day for 12 men. I'd bake a loaf of bread and uh, would just do it for the one day, back in a cab oven after having had our meal of the night. We're taking up supplies in the bush to do us then from, in this particular area, I'm thinking of now, from Christmas, or about Christmas until Easter, and then from Easter time until Christmas again. What did you eat? Bully beef, potatoes. I can remember going up the Gordon River on one occasion with a boatload of chaff, oats and brown for the horse, and supplies for the men. I had a... A 56 pound block of butter. Butter is just supplied in boxes, a 56 pounds each square. It was very rough on the river. And this day, this I knew the butter was pretty rancid. Not fit to eat because they used to give us what they couldn't sell locally. And this butter got bounced out of the boat into the, into the water. I remember looking back, I seen this thing bobbing up and out. Go, you butter, go. <laughs> I'm glad to see the last of you. Before this, I put up with about 10 hours and hauling my boat up over the rapids to get so far as it was then. And I had another, another 8 or 10 hours to go. There was not much game of that, that area, is there? Very little. Plenty of tiny cats. But they were horrible things. They were mangy, diseased, and uh, you wouldn't touch those less. They were literally starving. Which I suppose happened from time to time. Oh, it did, really. Quite frequently, we'd find that we'd be quite desperate, you know. We wouldn't catch a kangaroo or mostly a wallaby, snare a wallaby, and catch a fish too in the river. The Gordon River was renowned for the big sea run trout. I used to go up the river following the white bait, and we'd catch a few of those, and they were most delicious. How did you cook them? In the famous cab oven, with a little bit of fat in the bottom, and a small quantity of water. We sort of semi steam and, and roast him in the oven. And they would come out really delicious. And just open out and fall to pieces in big flakes. Some of these fish were, I can remember catching one on occasion there, it was 28 inches long and 32 inches around it. We had no, no means of, of weighing it, of course, but the, the steaks were just like red beef steaks. How'd you catch them? I mustn't tell you that. <laughs> Wouldn't be anything to do with dynamite, by any chance? I oh, know, nothing <laughs> like that. No. Uh, that could be netted them. And if they were, we had a good run, you could, you could fill a boat in, in an hour. But by the same token, if you lived in there longer, 
the lamp or eels was given to the fish and it's literally shell them out, eat all the fish. They pick a spout up and there uh, might be a dozen little lamp or eels inside of it. That, that is, just to be, they pick the fish's holes, just the skeleton left. And these things will be, that's eaten out in a few minutes, you know. What's, what's it used to happen down there? Well, 1943, I think it would be. We used to stop up there six months at a time. But used to, well, Mr. Smith, George Smith, and see, and he was running the, uh, the coral in. He used to tow the logs, rafts up and bring supplies down and one thing like scarf and store. Sometimes he wouldn't get down, you know, with a crook. But we always had plenty of tin tack and all that sort of thing. But you, you never got the very fresh vegetables or anything. You take a heap down with you, well, that wouldn't last all that long, you know, fresh meat and that sort of thing. No fridges or nothing like that in that time. You'd be living on tin bull and bacon. You get sick of the look of bacon. <laughs> bacon for breakfast, bacon for dinner, bacon for tea again. Dad's rather had a pet badger, you know, a little wombat. He used to run around in the stable one thing or another. And one of the voicemen, Mick Jones, Dad's brother Gordon, he was the boss of the job, and he sent this Mick Jones. He said, go and see what you can make up out of that bacon bone, Mick. Bud films or whatever you can do. They knock us up a bit of a feed and when they got to the camp, the other bushmen, Uncle Gordon and Dad, they could smell this beautiful smell. God, he, he knocked up some and he got some. God, Uncle Gordon sent it. He said, smells all right, Nick. What have you got in it? He said, I hate to tell you this, Gordon, but he said, I've got jelly in it. He <laughs> killed the bad <laughs> Man of that One of the things we enjoyed, which I found a very good standby, were mutton birds. We kept them in a cask in brine, but tie them up in a chaff bag and hang them into the river overnight. Let the water run through the sack for the whole of 12 hours or more, even 24 hours. And that would wash a lot of the brine out of them. Then we'd put them in the cab oven on a lid, or a, what we used to use for a lid was a a piece of a four gallon tin, about two inches cut off the bottom of it, and this turned upside down, with the bottom of the tin up, upper side, punch a few holes in it, put about four mutton birds on that, and roast them for about half an hour in the cap oven. And uh, we find that the, the brown skin would be crisp, the fat would fall out of it. And to me, they were just a delicacy. Because they were cooked in the cap oven, the heat all around them, and they were, were not cooked in fat, the fat would run out of them. We just say we used to thoroughly enjoy them. Sometimes we stuffed them with a onion and potato, perhaps too, and cooked them up in, in different different ways, but always cooked in a cap oven. Because the cap oven was our general standby for cooking all our meals. The main one I had in the Gordon River, which is still there incidentally, was twenty four inch oven, twenty four inch diameter. It held would hold four carrot Indians full of water. The steep oven. On one occasion the chap from the south coast, from down at Bruny Island, a man named Clifford decided he wanted a bath. We were coming out for Christmas time and he uh, set the someone up on the back outside our camp and he actually had a bath in it. And, and so it'll tell you how big it was to have a man to sit it and have a bath. <laughs> but the average oven would be there, I suppose, about 20 inches, 18, 20 inches diameter. And that would be a general cooking utensil for the camps. Every camp would have a camp oven. They were the general and the best way of cooking a meal. You could cook your bully beef in them. You could cook a fish in them, cook a wallaby. You could cook your potatoes in them. Make bread? And bread, or oh, particularly bread, yes. Oh, yes. You used to have a bottle of yeast, and uh, they'd be hanging up close to our fire with a string around its neck and no cork in the bottle. And we'd use nearly all of one bottle of yeast for a loaf of bread. And we used to have stuff called zestos to make the yeast. It was a dry, flaky material. We'd make up this every day, a little bit of this to put in the bottle, and we'll leave a little little in the bottle to keep it going. And I picked up this loaf of bread, or this dough, a loaf of dough, after breakfast in the morning, stick it up in a wooden trough, which was made of human pine, above our fire, there was two bars above the fire, and cover it over with about two or three flour sacks. And after the table, I'd get this down, I'd punch this dough down and put three loaves in it. It would take an hour and a half to cook. And two of us lit it on the fire. In the morning, that loaf was still warm. And they would just do us for one day, but for 12 men. 
I think anything cooked in the cabin, but it's cooked with coals on it, above it and below it, is really delightful to eat and always delicious to enjoy. While working the Pine Cove area he'd been in with his father in the 1930s, Bob Crane came across the Pine Creek Hut, the upper camp, which had remained undisturbed since those times. He took me to see it. There's the old camp through there, see? That's the old chimney. This here is flooring for a two-horse stable. They uh, had two horses in here at one time, and they uh, used to pull the small logs instead of pulling them right out to the harbour. They used to pull small logs to the right down there about 200 yards and roll them in that creek, and they used to float down in floods down to the harbour where they had a boom across it. Of course, the mouth of the creek, the hole in there, so they could uh, raft them and tow them to strong. This is the flooring of the old so Well, that, that'd be all you on pine flooring, see? Eh? Good hell. Just as good as the day that you made it there. Well, you can hardly see it because uh, no, uh, it just looks like the floor of the bush, but uh, well, the moss growing over it, and then no, when you scuffle your foot a bit, yeah. you're in pine flooring. Yeah. We'll go for another look at the old camp. Oh, the old hut's still here. Wedges, iron wedges. But they used to back the trees up with. All of them. Used to drive them in the saw cuts and that to hold them open. Now, the old slab huts, you've got a bit of a list to, to port, but uh, the uh, corrugated iron chimney is still pretty good shape. We'll go on and have a look. Not too good in there. Well, well, well. Hey, I sort of split out a split you and pine parlance. Well, this is like you and pine. coming back in time because there's no trace at all outside of anyone ever having been here before, unless you actually come across a bit of a track that had been cut in where the horses dragged the logs down, as we saw a few moments ago. And now we've walked quite unexpectedly into this old slab hut. There are two bunks, three bunks in the corner there with. The sacking still in them, there's uh, the old sack lining still on the walls, an old safe. Uh, I guess this might have been used by Wishman in recent times, do you think, or not? Oh, yes, there was a chap out here, done a little bit, oh, probably about 25 years ago. He was mucking around in here. He never stopped very long. Of course, the yeah. roof's got holes in it now and there's very little real shelter left, but it's just... Really, as though... You can look at them old socks. Oh, old socks hanging in the fireplace. Yeah, I reckon they Ah, uh, old singlets. No. Yeah. And the big fireplace with the chains hanging down over the spar across the top, with the camp ovens and the billies. That's right, yeah. What old, what old, old tins? Look down here. Hey, that's one of the saws they used to use. I pull them and cut them up with. And they did. That was that was me going through the floor. Oh, there you are. Yeah, there you are. See, see, here's a big auger. And you know what they used to use that for? Well, they get a great, a big, a huge pine, and if he was too wide, see, where the, a lot of the places was trenched out that way where they pulled that much timber, and they'd be trenched out, and they'd get an extra big tree, they, they wouldn't go through it. The horses couldn't pull it, they jam, see? And uh, they used to use this auger and bore holes in the end of them, or one hole, down on a slant down through the and then they'd fill it up with black powder and blast them open. Split them. She looks in pretty good nick too. Yeah, yeah. Look here, old old chain. Old, 
that drain out. And uh, the pipe catcher will walk up this, this spike and eat the laces and chew the boots if I didn't get them in before they got to them at the night time. We'd hear them all around the camp all night fighting. There were literally hundreds of them there. They were diseased. They were mangy and diseased. All, all the horrible demons they were. I feel quite sure that had a man been hurt so much in the bush he couldn't get up, they would eat him. Because I've seen them there. I've also saw hyenas down there at the Spiro River. When you say hyenas, what do you mean? Tasmanian tiger. Oh. We were so desperately short of food there that this Nielsen, he didn't want supplies to us. So we walked out of the sea to catch some fish. It was a nice landed area at those times, between Point Hibs and Port Davy. And because it was, it hadn't been fished, there were literally thousands and thousands of crayfish there. I walked to the sea with a piece of wallaby leg on a string, and I've caught 12 in my hand and thrown them onto on the shore. They that, that call back quicker than the two men could catch them and pick them up. But on one occasion, we, when we were so desperately short of food, we found an old 44-gallon drum on the rocks. We set it up half filled with water, filled up with crayfish, and we devoured these. This is what you used to do. We stopped there all Saturday night, and fish on Sunday, and uh, we'd try and catch some of the big trumpeter, which we used to them as stripies. But because there's a lot of heavy bull kelp along the West Coast shores, they would bite very well, but getting them out of the water through this kelp, and quite frequently you'd lose them. It's like I remember getting a, a couple of silly fine poles, about 40 or 15 feet long, and I'd throw my eye out over the board. I'd heave them in, I'd, I'd, I'd bite so viciously and voraciously that you'd probably get two at once. And uh, if you did get them, they had so much belly fat on them, we could cook them in their own fat in a camp oven. And they, used to, they used to last us for several days, actually. And we'd walk along the shore, going back by night time, the uh, Tasmanian tiger would follow us about 20 or 30 feet behind us. And, uh, I stopped one night behind other chaps and saw this, this thing with two pups. There. And we used to go back there quite frequently afterwards, looking for fish and trying to catch fish and crayfish, mostly with our hands, of course. And we found the lair where this thing used to live. We were, we were struck by the storm on one occasion. We were looking for shelter for ourselves. and found that this thing had its lair and camped in a, in a sandy bank, it was. And uh, that's about 1938. So I've always thought that if anyone really wanted a uh, Tasmanian tiger, that, that would be the place I'd look for them down there. That was Mr. Bob Thomas, who, you may remember, was one of the men Bob Crane mentioned as having stayed in the old Pine Creek hut 40 years before. He was the bush boss, and as a result of hearing his name mentioned while I was in the Pine Creek hut, I managed to locate him living in retirement in the northern Tasmanian town of Deloraine. George Smith, who also used to camp in the hut, now lives in Zeehan. So three of the men who used to live in the Pine Creek hut are taking part in this program. Bob Thomas. We used to depend on floods to bring our logs down the Gordon River. On one occasion in the Rocky Spit River, we had about 1,100 logs. We hadn't had, hadn't had a good flood for months and months, and uh, the logs would pile up on top of one another. Then we had, it was in, in November, about 1938, we had a tremendous flood. We had to shoot down below the rapids and catch these logs as they come out. We were catching them for three days and now three nights out of stop and we'd have to catch a log and run it ashore with a little rope on a dog and tie the log to anything that tied to a bit of scrub or a sapling as the river dropped so we'd have to drop it down as the road would pick it up again we did this as i say for three days and three nights many of the logs got away past us in the big floods and after we had to go out of the mouth of the river in macquarie harbour and try and get them roll them back off the beaches some of them out to sea of course we've always lost some of them and other gangs would get Logs that had changed their religion. That mm -hmm. We used to brand them and that chop the brands off and cut the end off the log. That would be their log. You know, clean skins in there. Yeah, that's right. First come, first served. Some chaps would get, get these logs. One of these old chaps who used to get them was a man named Tom Coots who lived in Kelly Basin, an old derelict old camp there. He was renowned for having a telescope. As these logs come out of the harbour, out of the, into the harbour, out of the river, He'd look at them in his telescope, locate where they were, 
is shoot down these old double-headed old boats and get these logs and turn them up to, into Kelly Waste to keep them there for some months until the logs quietened down more or less. And after he had a sufficient to get a raft to get a few bob for himself, he would go to Strawn and get someone to come out and pick up these logs and take them to Strawn. I went down to pick them up on one occasion with another man and uh, they've been there for so long that the holes in the logs were full of eels. We picked them up and the eels were dropping out of the holes in the logs. But this was typical of what used to happen. Episode 5, Horses and Accidents. It was, even by the standards of the day, a tough way to earn a living, working in almost constant rain and dampness, not to mention the wind and the cold, for up to six months at a stretch. There was an acceptance of hardship and death or injury that seems amazing when looked at today. Chuck was killed and uh, decided, and uh, myself had to help carry him out with a very thick scrub. The sergeant wasn't used to scrub. I was young and he wasn't. He was putting up a, a pretty hard go. He said, let us stop. He said, I can't go any further. I said, what shall we get him? He looked at me as <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was impossible to believe that anyone would say such a thing. But I, uh, that was my attitude towards life, I think, that uh, he was a friend of mine, but he, I couldn't anymore be used in God's hands then. He'd passed out of this life, and you've got to be factual about it, I think. And this is our attitude towards things generally, I suppose. I, I'll admit that those times I was pretty young and pretty tough too. But you had to be. I think you had to be tough. Otherwise, you, you sort of dropped out. Many chaps came and went there. It was not there very long. They found that life was too tough for them. They couldn't, they couldn't survive it, the conditions. The talk round the campfire at night at Pine Cove often reflected the harshness of logging life. I asked Bob Crane if he could remember what sorts of things his father and the other bushmen talked about. Jim Dowdy and Dad they were talking about uh, horses. Oh, Jim said to Daddy, he said... Uh, what happened to that horse? So and so, you know, he called him by the name. Dad said, Oh, he was no good. He said, He wouldn't pull with a butt. He said, wouldn't pull nothing. No, old Jim said, We had to make to him. Some of them were shipped over in Victoria by the uh, by an export company. They had two or three mills running here at the time. They sent this heap of horses over in Victoria, from Victoria, and it wasn't much good, you know. Dad had one of these horses in his team, like. He wanted a, another horse in his place, like and then said, no, you've got to keep him. If he's no good, you've still got to put up with him. So uh, Dad said, well, I can't get logged with a dumb horse like that. So he decided to try and get rid of him. Now yeah, they're pulling the dogs and had a shoot down the steep hill, say, down on the flat, and then they you know, used to take horse down and roll them into the river. We wouldn't carry it right to the river. And he so, well, I'll get him rid of him in an accident sort of way. And he drove him over the chute with his log behind him, thinking that his log could kill him. <laughs> anyway, he was that good. On the down hill going, he, he beat the log to the bottom. He still looked onto it. Like, and when the log ran out of his furs ago, he said, the damn thing, he said he never put it to the length of the log itself. He said, Did you send the log stop running, he stopped. <laughs> So uh, they're talking about this, and uh, Jim said, what happened? How'd you get rid of me in the finish? I said, I took him out in the water and down in a place called Bob's Bay down the harbour. And I shot him, and uh, he said, I chopped a hole in him so he'd sink. And anyway, later on, there was a joke called uh, Jinx Tonks was camped further. He was logging in the further around in the harbour, around the bay, and he rode around in the pump to where Dad was camping. And he said, oh, I say, Jack, he said, I don't know whether you've lost an horse or not, but he said, there's one hanging up on a snag right outside my camp and he stinks. <laughs> the horse had come up all my stuff in the snag. <laughs> Thank you.
up in the Jane River, I found an old grave. I found it because there was a, a pine cross at the head of this grave, and four pine trees, believe it or not, planted on each, each corner of the grave. And, and a, two very, very old time Pedraker saws put it across the, the head of the grave, too. And quite afterwards, if anybody knew about this, I was, this is what I was told that, which I believe to be quite true, that the Mount Lyle Company used to supply tucker to parties who would go out looking for a mineral. And if they found any mineral worthwhile, they would share it on a 50 50 basis with the company. But they got no wages, but they got supplies of food to keep them going. And uh, there was always that attitude that the Bonanza was immediately ahead of them, they'd find the Bonanza. And because they did, they went to the most incredible places and in incredible conditions. And this is way up in the Grain River. And these chaps, they cut pine logs there and left them up on the banks of the river where the floods would get, thinking they'd be washed down. Well, I found them there. They were bleached white. They'd been there for many, many years. And uh, I was told that this chap, the boss of this camp, had found this young boy, a very youthful boy, who was the camp boy, looking after the camp and keeping the supplies up to the men who were looking for mineral. He used to go out of the, the river and dip out a billy of water and he found some gold. And he was rather secret of this boy. And he wouldn't tell the other three chaps in the camp what he had. He had it in a matchbox. In those times, people on the West Coast used wax matches. They were the only matches they could keep under the wet conditions. And they used to make little copper matchboxes, little oval-shaped box that held a packet of wax matches. And this chap, he had this little copper packet full of gold. And it's, it's said that because he wouldn't disclose where he found the gold, they killed him and buried him there. Now, this is a story that I've been told. I went to a lot of detail to find out how it happened and where they were, but as I say, I found the grave myself, saw it, and uh, I found the logs along the banks of the river. We, we raked them down and put them into the river afterwards, we got them down to Strawn. This is one of the stories that I know to be a true story as far as buying the grave is concerned. How it happened to the boy, I, I couldn't verify that. Did they have his name on the grave? Yes, he lived on the grave. I, uh, I've forgotten his name now. I've heard of it. I hope people mentioned it two single times. I was talking to a chap about it not long ago and he mentioned the, the boy's name. It wouldn't be the first man or boy to be killed over gold. Certainly not, no. But it'd be something extraordinary in the West Coast because there wasn't very much gold there. While murder was comparatively rare, death and injury, either in the bush or in the mines, were all too common. Bob Thomas again. There was a very good system on the West Coast called the Montague Medical Union, whereby employees would contribute sixpence per week out of their pay, and the employer would pay this into the Montague Medical Union which would provide the employees with sickness benefits, hospital benefits, and a free doctor, but they had to be taken to the doctor. That was a pretty hard and expensive operation in many instances there. I can remember because my father had men working in the bush, and some of them were very inexperienced men, were quite frequently serious accidents. It was a case of getting these men to the hospital so quickly as he could. In the case of an accident, he was so a person's leg up himself. And one instance, uh, a man injured one of our horses very, very seriously. And I remember sitting up in the early hours of the morning with a whole hurricane lamp when my father sold this leg up with this mare of ours, a trap mare, and uh, things of that nature. That was quite a common occurrence in those days. Horses and men? Horses and men. Oh, yes, of course, yes. Of course, we had to rely on our own resources. When I went to the Gordon River afterwards, and then I can remember sewing up my own hand. And I can show you here now, and... Oh, I cut yes. it with an axe, I put stitches in there, I used to get a, a hair out of a horse's tail, and dip it in the billy of boiling water and sew it up. And we just thought nothing about that. I remember a chap, he came from the, uh, the south coast, and he uh, was holding a vine on a log and he'd chop it off, and he'd actually skip along the vine and chop his finger off. And the finger fell into the palm of his hand, and I said, what will I do? Well, I said, I, well, I can take it off, I think. He couldn't have it taken off, he said he played a violin. And he didn't want to take it off, so uh, I put a stick on each side of it, wrap it up, tied it up fairly securely. He was a long way from a doctor. I had to send him to Strawn, row him up to Strawn. And the time he got there, it was several days old. And the local doctor, Dr. Whiteford, he wanted to take the finger off if it had become violent gangrenous. He was 
still wouldn't have it taken off. So I sent it to, to Queenstown, and Dr. Packham took it off at Queenstown because it was pretty far gone at that stage. This is the sort of thing that happened. There are things of this nature. So you had to rely on your own resources. Can you remember perhaps stories of endurance of people who were who were injured and, and getting them out and that kind of Yes, thing? I can. I were a chap and cut his foot half his foot half off. He had to be taken to the doctor at Strawn and I met two chaps in a boat to row him to Strawn, which was a long way sixty miles actually from where we were. And Macquarie Harbour is a hundred square miles of water, but it's shallow, and because it's shallow it becomes very rough. You get a lot of rolling slop in a, in a strong wind, and you get a lot of rough winds on the west coast. And this chap was bailing for 24 hours, bailing the boat out. The fellow with his foot half cut off all over the road to get him to the doctor. This is uh, sheer providence to help them to survive. And uh, I've done this too. I've uh, had to row to Strawn under very hard, torrid conditions such as this, with a person very badly injured. I suppose that. Uh, you would do it and wouldn't think about it. We didn't, we didn't think about it either. Our aim was to get him there as soon as we can, because it could have been one of us. It could have been myself or somebody else there. Another occasion, a man got a piece of steel in his eye, and he sucked for three or four days. But I could see that his eye was giving him a lot of trouble, so I meant to take him off to Strawn, and uh, two men had taken him to Strawn. And while he was away, we had to keep the job operating, and two chaps who were supplying bring up supplies to us, to our camp, and to the horses. It's very wet weather, very wet conditions at this particular time, and they wanted more money to do the job. And I wasn't able to give it to them. So they sat on the bank of the river for almost a week. And I used to go down over night time after we finished the day's work, row down to our depot, 20 miles down, and load up my supplies of half a ton of chaff, oats and bran and supplies for ourselves, and I said, come back in the middle of the night, so I'm the early hours of the morning. Sometimes I put 11 hours in the paddles there with the river rising over 60 feet. And it's a roaring torrent of the flood. And uh, I've, I've rode for so long, sometimes I, I couldn't go any further. So I tied up my boat to a tree on the bank. I cut a piece of bark off a tree, skip me off up on the wet ground, lay on the wet ground on this, on this piece of bark for two or three hours to get a, some sleep, get up and go on again and to start work in the morning. This was quite a frequent and common occurrence through the things like this. At this particular time, and under those conditions, I never even thought about it, I just did it. Because I wouldn't let anything stop me. The thing had to be done, it was done. By hook or by crook. I wouldn't see them and the horses starve, and I wouldn't see the men go without food. And I wouldn't see us timber not coming out of the forest. The early people had to be tough because they were isolated and there was little medical attention or hospitals or anything, but some of the stories of fortitude are amazing. I know of a case that happened in about 1956, in the days when Mount Lyle and EZ had combined together to explore southwest Tasmania. Southwest Tasmania was alleged to be unexplored, there were no roads, it was a wild timber-covered country and we uh, had 6,000 square miles and we used a helicopter to get our men in and out. Well, I was having lunch one Sunday at home and a jeep drove into the backyard, a police jeep. The policeman jumped out and he had a young fellow with him called George Martin who had only a pair of trousers on and a pair of boots, no socks, no shirt, no hat. And the visible part of his body from the waist up was terribly cut about and scratched. And the policeman said that he had walked in from a place called the South Andrew River to tell us that his mate, Keith Morrison, the previous day had almost severed his foot with an axe. They were working for the Hydroelectric Commission cutting a track out on the Andrew River. There was uh, this man, Keith Morrison, who was the eldest member of the party, and Georgie Martin, who to be about 19, and a boy of about 14. This accident happened at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Keith put an axe clean through his foot and almost severed it. He was a bushman of considerable experience. He got a tourniquet around his, the pressure point in his groin, 
and lie on his back. And I wrapped his foot up the best I could in a blanket. And then Keith said, told Martin that uh, his only hope of survival was for Martin to walk to Gormison to get help. And uh, Morrison was an old friend of mine. He wasn't working for us, but he was working for the HEC. But he said, if you can find Jeff Hutspeth and get a helicopter, there's some chance that I might get out of this. Now, there are no tracks from the Andrew River to uh, Gormison that you had the fellow out to make his way through the bush. They'd been dropped in there by helicopter. And Mang Martin said, well, how the devil do I find my way to the Gormison? And Morrison said, you climb that hill up there and you will see Mount Allen. Now, he said, make a beeline for it. Just keep your eyes on Mount Allen and walk to it. And sooner or later, you will cut the old uh, North Isle Railway. When you do, turn right and walk up the railway to Linda and into Gormison and get me help. So Martin set off at half past nine on Saturday morning. And they arrived at my house at one o'clock on Sunday. And we got busy straight away. I got the field engineer and the helicopter pilot. And we had to put Martin into the helicopter to show us where his mate was. And I suppose it was two o'clock before we got away. So we flew out and we circled the area and we could, there were fires going. The boy had had wit to light fires and make a lot of smoke and he had tried desperately to cut a landing area. Now to get a big helicopter down you want a circle of at least or 120 feet. The boy had one of about 50. He was only a kid. We had no hope of landing in it so Max Holloman, the pilot, put the helicopter into the Andrew River. There was a shingly bank in the middle of the river and he said, I'll put it here and stay here flying it. Because he'd have been washed down the stream otherwise, so he was flying it in a stationary position, you know, with its, with its wheels on the shingle. But we swam ashore and Martin had an axe with him and we found the start of this track. We walked along a bit over two miles with a stretcher and there was Morrison lying on his back with his foot up in the crook of a tree the little boy had walked some miles back and brought a tent up and built it over him. Keith Morrison had a fire just beyond his head and a fire at either side of him. Keep him warm. Well, the boy had done everything he possibly could, plus try to cut a landing ground. Well, Morrison was uh, the colour of parchment, very faint pulse. And he had lain there. From nine o'clock Saturday till I suppose half past two on Sunday by this time, letting that tourniquet go every twenty minutes. Someone had told him every twenty minutes it had to be released. And he'd watch till the blood soaked through the blanket by his foot. And uh, he was able to talk and welcomed us. He grinned at me, he said, I knew you'd come, Jeff. And that's about all he said. Anyway, we got him into the stretcher, we did what we could with his foot and got him into the stretcher and tore up some blanket strips and tied him into it because we had a pretty rough carry, we had to haul him over logs and things. And then when we got back to the Andrew River, there was the trouble of ferrying a man on a stretcher out into the middle of the river. The river's deep and running fairly fast. So Georgie Martin, who'd done all this walking for some 30 hours, fell to King Billy Tree and split us some logs and we made a rough raft and floated Morrison out and uh, got him into the chopper. By the time we, he was in the chopper, there was just room for him and me, and we had to leave uh, George Martin and the boy and my field engineer behind, and we went into Queenstown. How long had he been hovering on that shingle? Oh, two hours. Engine running, just slowly, just to hold him in position. Well, we got him, uh, when we put Morrison into the helicopter, I thought he was gone, his pulse was so slow. He was a shocking colour, so we did something that the textbook shows all wrong. We put a great slug of uh, rum into him. You could feel his pulse pick up. Anyway, he flew to Queenstown. He held my hand all the way. And uh, we got him into hospital. And then we went back to get the three people we'd left behind, including Georgie Martin, who was the real hero of the thing with all his walking. And I suppose it was six o'clock by the time we got there. We had to land again in the middle of the river and they swam out. And we put them all aboard and home we came. Now I had a car waiting to take Georgie Martin to Strawn where he lived. Not in your life. He said his job was up in the hospital. 
So we delivered him up to the hospital and he sat all night with Keith Morrison, sat up by his bed. Been without sleep this stage for about two and a half days, you see. And on Monday morning when they pronounced that Morrison was now out of danger, Georgie Martin said, all right, now I'll go home strong. And that's what he did. Well, now, there are three notable people in this. The boy, for a start, who got enough wit to light fires and look after Keith. Keith, who managed to stay alive, which I think I'd have given up the ghost. You lie there for 30 hours, bleeding to death, with very little hope of uh, any rescue. And Martin, who made this incredible walk across Bush, he had to swim the King River. And then he set off fully clad with an axe and things, you see, and in swimming rivers and things, he divested himself of his gear. And he walked all through the night non-stop and staggered all the way into Gormison to the police station. That's fortitude, if you like, on the part of two men in particular and a boy. Episode 6, Hard Rock Mining. Timber, mining and some fishing are the traditional industries of the West Coast. George Smith. A good bushman's a good miner, or a good miner's a good bushman for this very same reason, he has initiative. You can be a good miner in two or three months if you get with the right man. You can be a pretty good timber getter in two or three months. Some of the finest axemen in the country are bank clerks, and to me, you don't have to be brought up in the line. You, well, you've got to have a will to learn and some initiative. The situation's much the same now. It hasn't changed. What else changes is there's not so many people that believe that that can be done and they don't try. In those days, you had to try. There was no job in the bush, well, there was one in the mine, and that's where you went. And you have to get the extra shilling or 18 pence a day of being a really competent man, so you put in the extra effort. There were sort of two races of men. There was a tremendous amount of timber getting in the early days of the West Coast because the mines all operated on wood-fired boilers. The uh, mines themselves, because of their funny old methods they used, were very heavily timbered. By heavily timbered, I mean they were supported with huge quantities of very big timber. I've seen legs in the Mount Lyle mine that were three feet in diameter. They were tree trunks. Well, there were a big gang of men employed in the bush getting that timber for the underground mines and also for the, for the firewood. They cut 2,000 tonnes of firewood a week in the early days of the Mount Isle smelters just to keep the smelter running. And it became traditional, I think, that lots of families became bush workers and the jobs passed on from father to son and to grandson. While on the other hand, uh, other families became miners and remained miners. And I don't think there was much interchange, except that uh, I suppose by the 19... 20s or 1930s, anyway, and the amount of timber being cut was very materially reduced, and the firewood was quite small in quantity. A great many of the old timber cutter people then turned over to gun mining. But by then, there was a fair amount of open cut mining at Mount Lyle, and most of these men preferred to work in the, under the open skies and open cuts. They weren't the old heavy ground miner types at all. That race of men, of course, is quite dead. There's none of that sort of mining these days. And the grizzled old miner who uh, did his job with great artistry and skill is quite gone. Mining today is a matter of machinery and rush and tear, and it's a young man's job that doesn't need any experience. To see Queenstown for the first time is to encounter a severe environmental shock. You might be excused for a moment, wondering if you've happened on a lunar landscape. While the bare mountains and hills undoubtedly have a stark beauty all of their own, it's a horrifying example of how industry can destroy natural surroundings. I asked Geoffrey Blaney how the mining operations of the Mount Lyle Company had caused such a total destruction of the original rainforest. Well, the denudation around Mount Lyle started in the 1890s. First of all, the woodcutters came in and they chopped down all the good timber. Everything then depended on firewood, the steam boilers, the... Uh, domestic stoves, uh, even a lot of the locomotives used firewood. 
once the West Coast had 20,000 people, the consumption of firewood was on a colossal scale. I once worked out that in 1900 there were probably about a thousand woodcutters on the West Coast, professional full-time woodcutters. Uh, the Mount Lower Company alone had 200 or 300 woodcutters working full-time. Now, the whole countryside was crisscrossed with water flumes, and wooden water flumes. And the cut wood was sent down the water flumes to the nearest railway line and then railed into the smellest of the boiler houses, into the power generation plants. Uh, before long, all the trees were chopped down. Uh, in 1896, they started at Mount Lyle a method of smelting called brick smelting, and it used the sulphur in the ore as fuel. And so the great smelters there were belching up into the air clouds of sulphur fumes. Uh, the sulphur fumes stopped anything new from growing in the town. You know, all, all growth was killed. In summer, bushfires would descend and burn the stumps that were left by the woodcutters. Heavy rainfall did the rest of the damage. You know, since, since nothing would grow, since all the trees were chopped down, the terrain was precipitous, the rainfall was high and the rain scoured away the topsoil, the peat, you know, even the clay, and all you were left with in the end was the skeleton the skeleton of the hills. And by 1910, the landscape was really at a very strange site. There was nothing like it in Australia. I suppose it can never come back either. I myself think that now the smelters have been closed in Mount Lyle and things do grow and the vegetation is creeping back under the hills. It's piffling scrub, but it's beginning to cover the area around the old smelters. And I think there's a strong case for using a defoliant in the area and keeping perhaps a square mile or two square miles of land in its a denuded state, uh, the advantages of this, it, it would show what uh, an industrial process, unregulated, can do to the landscape. Uh, secondly, the kind of smelting they had there was really a technological triumph. It was one of the great things in the history of metallurgy that they could virtually smelt copper ore without fuel. Uh, 1902 at Mount Lyle is one of the great dates in the history of man and his use of fire. There, they, they for the first time in the history of the world, they smelted ores on a large scale without fuel. Now, the ore came from the mine, great big lumps of rock. They tipped, tipped the rock straight into the furnace, not treated in any way. The rock just went straight into the furnace and, and, and they smelted it. Eleven big blast furnaces were working and uh, the chimney stacks were puffing up these great clouds of white smoke into the air. Uh, the smelters worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But the sulphur was always in the air, pretty smelting they call it. It's also in certain lights, when the sun comes out at Mount Lyle, especially in late afternoon and it shines on those hills, it really is a strange, sombre, beautiful sight. And I think there's a very strong case for trying to stop the vegetation from returning to parts of those hills. Jeff Hudspeth is a former general manager of the Mount Lyle Company and West Coaster born and bred. My father was the youngest of 11 children in Hobart. He went to Hutchins School. And when he matriculated there, he joined the Union Steamship Company and went to Straw. And that would be at the end of 1897. And he stayed in Straw for about six months, I gather. And then he was attracted by an offer of a job at the Mount Isle Company in Gormanson. So he went up there. He remained in Gormanson from 1898 to 1914 returned there in 1922 and finally retired in 1944. So he had a long association with the company and he had always been interested in historical matters. And he had a great fund of stories of the early days of the West Coast and uh, a lot of jolly interesting records. And he'd been tangled up in some of the... Uh, famous events, some of them uh, could hardly bear repetition. The Mount Lyle Company originally worked uh, the Mount Lyle Blow, which was an old open cut, and uh, they dug a considerable hole by about 1902, and they needed to batter back the walls of the open cut, but they were hindered in doing so by the fact that the South Lyle Company owned the land adjoining and wouldn't sell. And those days, the mining leases had to be pegged every year. And if your lease fell to you on the 29th of March, at midnight on the 29th, you had to re-peg. Anyway, the Mount Lyle Company was just about 
stuck with this mine. They couldn't play back the batters and they couldn't go any deeper. So my father and the two other men who afterwards became very famous, Mr. R. M. Murray and Mr. A. H. P. Moline, got up there at midnight the night that South Isle people were due to repeat their leases. Two of them armed the shotguns. And when old Mr. Ryan of the South Isle mine came along to drive his pegs, he bailed up with two shotguns. One time my father drove them out the whole company pegs into the ground. And they did this just after midnight. My father then got on a horse and rode to Strawn, caught a little ship called the Mahinapur to Hobart and registered the leases. In his own name, you have to do them in his own name. When he came back to the Mount Lyle Company, he gravely sold them to the company for the price of his ticket from English to Hobart. In other words, he got his expenses refunded. Well, that's the bare bones of the story. Now, an act like that in these days would be regarded as highway robbery or criminal. But it was common in those days. Everyone jumped everyone else's leases if they possibly could. Not always with a shotgun, but uh, that's the way it went. The real old-timers, miners who worked at the turn of the century, are of course long since dead. But some of them lived to a ripe old age. When Geoffrey Blaney was researching his book, The Peaks of Lyle, in Queenstown in the early 1950s, he managed to talk with some of the original prospectors. Well, I was very lucky. Uh, some of the early prospectors were still around, and men with good memory. One of the uh, first prospectors on the west coast was a man named Jimmy Elliott. He'd be 112 if he were alive today. He was originally a Victorian and his father got miners' disease at a place called Barry's Reef up beyond Bacchus Marsh. And the family was virtually broken up and the boys realised that they might get some money by going to Tasmania. And uh, Jimmy and his younger brother chopped down a great big tree at Barry's Reef and they got enough money from the sale of that wood to come down to Melbourne and to buy a boat ticket to Burnie and they went then to Mount Bischoff or Waratah which then was the big town on the west coast. There was a tin mining town. He got there in 1879 or 1880. Then he walked overland, uh, I suppose it would be about 80 or 90 miles, to a place near the present Mount Lyle. Mount Lyle wasn't discovered, and he got a job in a little gold mine. And he was there digging the trench just a few feet below the surface of the ground when they discovered the quartz reef that yielded the first good gold on the west coast. It was a result of discovering the gold at Lynch's Creek, where Jimmy Elliott dug the trench, that prospectors came and they pushed on to Mount Lyle, so that he was there right at the start. And that's a primary source. Yes, yeah, he's a good source. He was a very good source. When I first met him, he'd be 83 or 84. He was so stooped that when he came round, I used to roll him cigarettes. And when he'd come round and he'd open the door, instinctively one would look at the door at the wrong height because <laughs> he'd come in so low. Always wore an overcoat, uh, a man of very little education, but extremely well-spoken, a good vocabulary, yeah. very wide interests. He'd been a miner or billiard room keeper or publican most of his life. Uh, he'd always wanted to become a member of the Stock Exchange. Well, he'd never really, he'd never really achieved that ambition, and perhaps he was better off uh, because he'd had a fall and, a, and an interesting life. But, you know, I'd come straight from university, and I had the mistaken idea that Educated people uh, probably had the most reliable memory. And it took me a long while to realise that a, a person of little education relies more on his memory. And if he's actually seen an event take place, he remembers that what, what he's seen very accurately. And it took me a long while to realise you know, what a superb memory this old man had. Uh, he had a much better memory than university professors or lawyers or doctors or members of the learned profession. It was astonishing the things that he remembered and later I could pick up you know, how accurate he was. Can you give some examples? Well, he was there in the 1880s and I suppose only about, in most years, there'd only be about 20 or 30 men on that part of the West Coast. Now, there was no newspaper, a very little record available of that period. So I used to ask him questions about who was there, how they lived, uh, you know, how they brought their supplies in on their backs. And uh, one of the important prospectors was a man named James Crotty, who later became by the standards of the time, a millionaire. And I tried to find out from him what happened to Crotty. He was working on the field, then he went away for a long time. Well, he said, I'll tell you what happened to him. Uh, he went to Sydney and he worked as a tunneler in the sewers there in 1889 or 1890. He earned uh, 14 shillings a day 
and he used to attend a certain hotel and became friendly with the barmaid there and he introduced him occasionally to rich people and sometimes he would sell shares in the mine to the rich people. And uh, I had no means of testing this and it seemed rather unlikely to me because a prospector who's interested in a particular area and holds shares, he tends not to go away from that area. But sure enough, I found out uh, to my astonishment a year or so later that a New South Wales squatter named Kelly had bought shares in this particular year and that fits in. But so often, you know, he told me once about a great court case in very great detail and I could never find any record of the court case. Eventually I found the court case. It took place in 1896 and in those days court cases in the Tasmanian newspapers, maybe they still are, were reported in great detail and, uh, you know, his memory was really astonishing. He, he was a miner, he was a prospector, very interested in share speculation. Once uh, in the late 1880s, he became very interested in a silver mine at Zeehan and he believed that the shares were going to rise. And he walked overland to Hobart, you know, just a single track. It would be about 170 miles. He walked to Hobart, bought the shares and came back. And that was his last, that was the last time he left the West Coast, 1888. He used to come round to my place, with some tobacco and I'd roll him cigarettes. And he came round a few times and I was away. I went down to Hobart, just three or four days. And when I came back, he said, oh, where have you been? He said, I've been looking everywhere for you. Oh, I said, I've been to Hobart. Hobart, he said, Hobart, he said, you certainly get around. <laughs> he lived in Bowers Hotel, Jimmy Elliott. Bowers were very good to him. They looked after him. And I suppose he paid them, you know, part of his old age pension. He slept on a balcony and uh, most days were cold there, so he'd sit in front of the fire in the lounge. Every hotel had a fire or two going, a wood fire. And uh, he'd poke the fire and talk and say, well, but he was a great one and... The king size whisper. And I'd be sitting there beside the fire talking to him and somebody would come into the room where he was and he'd put his hand beside his mouth and he'd say to me, see that fellow who's just come in there? I'd say, yeah, yeah, I can see him. He's all Scotty. He's just run away with somebody else's wife. <laughs> because these king size whispers could be heard very clearly. Jeff Hudspeth not only knew and talked to some of the original miners, he worked with them underground. I had a very lucky life. At the age of about 22, by accident, I became the underground manager at a mine called the Lyle Comstock, which is seven or eight miles out of Queenstown. I was out there as the assistant when the manager had an accident and he was away for months. Now, the foreman and shift bosses on the Comstock mine were all of my father's vintage, and I'm 22. Well, they were up in there. Well, the, the old form was probably about 70. And they were men who knew no other place than the Lyle mining field. They had come from far and wide, but they'd, some of them had been on the West Coast for 50, 60 years. They were very hard workers, and they played very hard. They were terrorists for drinking. It never interfered with their work. I've never known a foreman not to turn up to work on time. Uh, I've known shift bosses, but not foreman. And furthermore, they had a habit that if they'd had a particularly wild night, they'd try to get up and get to work half an hour early just to show how strong they were. If you had to remember one of the old timers uh, in particular, would there be one man? Yes, certainly. I worked for my early part of my life for an amazing man called Jack Pearton. He was completely illiterate and he had come up the hard way through the ranks as a miner and become the underground manager of a group of four mines. And he was the roughest, toughest thing I've ever met in my life. And he was known the length and breadth of Australia as the roughest and toughest. And he had collected round him in the North Mount Lyle mine a gang of travelling bosses and ship bosses who matched his spirit and instinct. They were all uh, elderly, they were all very experienced, and they were all excellent leaders. Old Jack Pearton himself was the most brilliant old general and uh, knew more about mining or underground mining of the old-fashioned the old kind than any man I've ever met. But uh, some of his ship bosses 
where every bit is interesting. There was one particularly famous man who I developed a great ta attachment for. He was called Jimmy Lonigan. Now, Lonigan had come from Ireland as a boy, and he'd never lost his Irish accent. And he was a grizzled old fellow. And I suppose in the days that I worked with him, I was a travelling boss with him for a start, and later his boss. He'd be uh, a man of 65 or approaching 70. And his hobby was Royal Swan rum. He drank large quantities of it that night, and he often showed it the following day. He never missed a time, but he'd be very shaky when he came to work. As I got to know him better and realised his troubles, I used to talk to him sometimes and say, for goodness sake, cut it out. He'd laugh at me and say, ah, oh, yes, my son. But we worried about him a bit, but he was a good old ship boss. Anyway, I can remember a famous incident one night when I was at home, it was about nine o'clock at the night, the telephone went and it was James Lonigan talking from the thousand foot level of the North Mount Lyle mine on the telephone and uh, Ah, he said, Jeffrey, my son. He said, I've had a terrible experience. And I said, yes, Jim, what's the matter? And he said, well, I've just seen a red Indian. And he said, I'm very shaken. And I said, well, how much have you been drinking today? He said, he'd gone on the ship at four o'clock. And uh, he said, it's a strange thing, but I hadn't been drinking at all. But he said, I think it must be the DTs. Caught up with me at last. So I said, well, where are you? And he said, I'm on the, at the shaft on the thousand foot level. And I said, well, for goodness sake, stay there. I'll come up and see you. So uh, he rang off and I was going up by myself. I thought it better to ring my boss, old Jack Pearton. Since Lonigan was a great personal friend. And if I started firing Lonigan, I was going to run into Pearton head first. So I rang John Owen. And John Owen said, the bloody old scoundrel. He's got DTs at last. I've been expecting it for years. And he said, I'll come with you. And we went up and changed and made our way underground and up to the thousand foot level. And there's old Jimmy sitting on a form on the flat shaft. And he's looking very disconsolate. And he said, I can't understand. But he said, I'll swear I saw a red Indian. So we laughed at him. And he didn't seem to be drunk, but... Uh, we said, well, come on, we'll play this ghost. You take us to where you saw the Red Indian. On the thousand foot level, to the furthest end from the shaft would be all half to three quarters of a mile away. And you go up through long old wooden galleries. And there were two long galleries that were parallel to each other. So Jack Pitton said, I'll take Lonigan up the south gallery. You make your way up the north gallery and any Red Indians will be caught in the trap far end. So away we went and we we're both sniggering, you see, and I'm by myself and I got nearly to the end of my gallery and blow me down I see a red Indian. In those days we carried carbide lamps and uh, it was a poor light, you know, but I wasn't in any doubt. Feathers? Feathers and the lot, but it was only a fleeting glimpse. And it pulled me up in the tracks momentarily, but uh, however I continued on and I rounded the top corner where there was a Crib room, that's a lunch eating place, you know, cut out of the rock, cowering in one corner, <coughs> bloody red Indian. John O'Pearton arrived with Lonigan, and John O'Pearton's face was just a picture. Oh, no, Lonigan had seen a red Indian. Well, this explanation of the whole thing is that we had a timekeeper who was going to a fancy dress party and he'd elected to change underground. He was a crazy fellow and he decided that if he rushed his job. He could get away by about nine o'clock. He shouldn't be knocking off till midnight, but he'd taken his fancy dress underground and rushed through his job and then gone down to this crib room, thousand foot level to change with the intention of putting a long oilskin coat on the top of the lot. Lonigan on his rounds had come along and cut him off from his coat and we'd fix it. And uh, it was a fair cop. So poor old Lonigan was completely exonerated and uh, everyone felt happy about it. And old Jim stayed sober for weeks after that and taught him an awful lesson. But I suppose it was about two months later that uh, he rang again one night. 
Well, this time he's in frightful trouble. He's in the Crown Isle mine on the 600 level. And he's talking from the shaft again on the telephone. And I said, Jeffrey, my son, he said, that I've had it this time. He said, I did have a drop before I came to work. And I said, well, what, why have you had it, Jim? And I said, I've just seen a horse. I said, what? He said, there's a horse in, in six stuff. Oh, I said, don't be silly, Jim. He said, that's the trouble. He said, I am being silly. But he said, I swear it's a horse. So I did the same thing, but I didn't ring Peterton this time. I thought, poor old chap, I'll fix him. So I went up and found a friend on the 600 level, and we got up the six day. And blow me down, there is a bloody horse. See, when you're mining underground, you cut a great stoke, a great hole in the ground, you must send waste material in to fill up the space, otherwise the end will fall in. This waste material was mined on the surface of an old quarry 600 feet above, and it would be sent down passes in a hole in the ground. Up in the front of the quarry, they pull the trucks around the draft horses, one of the draft horses, and slip and fall down the mud pass. The dead is a doornail sitting on top of the mud pile. So old Jimmy, once again, was exonerated. <laughs> The interesting part to me was that Jim at the time wasn't sure whether it was a horse or just his DT. Episode 7 The Future of Mount Lyle. Well, the old time miner or well, the shift boss or foreman, had a very close tie with his men. You must remember that all the old foremen were uneducated people, and they all had risen from the ranks. They had got to the stage where they'd become a boss over their own mates, and the tradition developed not only at Mount Lyle or on the west coast of Tasmania, this is, I think, universal of those days in the old mines, that the ship boss or foreman regarded the men who worked for him as part of his family, and he felt himself wholly and totally responsible for them. Uh, no ship boss would ever leave the mine until he'd counted all his men, and he'd always be the last out. No good ship boss would ever not visit all his men at least twice during the shift. And when things got tough, and they often did in the old mining days when it was all pick and shovel work and very heavy ground in many cases, those old fellows would go to the most amazing lengths of heroism to uh, save lives or save injured men. And I've seen some amazing things done by simple fellows who would have been embarrassed to be given a medal or anything after us. They just felt it was in their normal duty. I mentioned to you earlier a great old chap called Jack Pearton who became the underground manager. And I can remember one night in the Crown Isle mine when we had a fall of ground, several hundred tonnes came down and uh, pinned one of the men that were working in the stoke. They were Italians. There'd be four men in the party. The northern Italians that we had in the mine were tremendous fellows. But we had a number of southern Italians who were very good workers, but they weren't renowned for any particular courage. And this fellow got pinned, and his three mates promptly fled. And uh, they found the shift boss on the level below. And he came rushing up to the stoke, and this chap was buried to the waist. And he's hollering. So uh, I was rung, and Jack Pearton also and he and i went up and we got into the stoke and take us forward i suppose the fellow had been there for three quarters of an hour by the time we got there and there were four ship bosses working away the man's own mates had fled completely and jack Pearton and i joined them to make uh, a party of six well this stoke was a great big underground cave i suppose it'd be uh, 150 feet long, 60 feet wide, and with a roof about 15 feet over our head, and the stuff had fallen from the middle of it. It was pretty obvious that an awful lot more was going to fall. You generally get a warning underground, little bits of rock start to drip, and you hear creakings and things. 
Well, the way we were working desperately, and we got this fella uncovered, we found that he was caught just above the right ankle between two big stones. Well, we had some rescue gear. We had a jack and bars and things. We'd do what we could. We couldn't budge these two stones and get his foot out. And the man's seriously hurt. His foot would be crushed. And uh, he was making a hell of a noise. And that's pretty unnerving if you in a situation where it's obviously dangerous. You've got a man hollering. Now, old Jack Pearson didn't work with us. He was a non-smoker. And he sat on a boulder about 10 feet away from us, watching the back above us. And he asked me for a pack of cigarettes. And he sat there and smoked cigarettes. And just advised us and directed. And so there were five of us toiling around this heap. What Jack did was psychologically very clever by sitting there calmly smoking a cigarette. He put a good deal of confidence into us. But however, we weren't just doing any good at all. And the, this continual screaming by the man wasn't very funny. Jack Pearson arose from the rock and walked forward and clumped at that bloke under the jaw and knocked him cold. And uh, there was silence, you see, and he said, now get on with it. Well, it seemed a brutal thing to do, but uh, in retrospect, it was dead right. We were able to really concentrate on what we were doing. Because, you see, while he was conscious, every time we tried to move the stone, we hurt him, and he'd scream all the more. But when the man's unconscious, you can have a real go. Anyway, uh, I suppose we worked for another quarter of an hour. This fellow was still out, and was looking quite hopeless. And old John suddenly stood up, and he picked up... In the, out of the rescue box, we had an axe. And he said, stand back, you fellows. He said, you're never going to get that foot out. And he said, Jeff, uh, get your shirt off. Be ready to stop the bleeding. And with one swipe, he took the fellow's leg off uh, just above the ankle. Well, I, for one, got an awful shock. You know, it seemed such a brutal thing to do. We had a stretcher there. And we bundled him onto the stretcher, and I got tourniquets onto his pressure point. And Jack Pearson said, hurry, you fellas, we've only got minutes now. And uh, we had to lower him 60 or 70 feet. You put a fellow into a vein stretcher, and you lace him into it. We got him bound up as best we could in a rough fashion and lowered him out of the stope and got out. And, you know, 10 minutes later, 2,000 tons came down. And we'd have been dead as a doornail if Pearson hadn't had the initiative for a start to knock the fella out. And the cold guts, that's all I can leave with, cut his leg off. When I reported the whole thing to the management the following day, they sent for old Jack to congratulate him. He just looked slightly stunned. He said, well, what did you bloody well expect me to do? Get me, get me ship bosses killed, did you? Anyway, this fellow Tony lived, and for many, many years afterwards, he worked in the change house at North Isle. He had a wooden leg and he had a nice soft job because the company always looked after people like that. And uh, that's the sort of man that John O was and so many of his other foremen were like them. Jeff Hudspeth, a former general manager of the Mount Lyle Company. In mining terms, 80 years is a long, long run. I asked Jeffrey Blaney how the Mount Lyle Company had managed to last so long where others had failed. Well, I suppose the first answer is that they're lucky enough to be in an area where uh, there are more than one large ore bodies, and as one ore body becomes exhausted, they've either found a new ore body or a previously known ore body, which was unplayable, has become playable by changes in prices or the development of new techniques. Uh, it's lasted a long time, partly, I think, because of good industrial relations. But I think the field could have been cooked in the 1920s. Uh, you know, it's the kind of place which, once closed, you don't reopen could have been closed in the 20s, closed in the 30s, closed in the 40s, closed in the 50s, closed in the 60s, if either side, directors and management or unions, had been unyielding. I think sometimes when, when conditions have been you know, bad, uh, the company has poured money from other sources into the place to keep it going, even though it's worked at a loss. At other times, the men have made concessions and said, well, you know, we will no longer ask what we think we're entitled to for a fair day's work if... Yeah, conditions are going to be bad for the next three or four, six months, so that give and take you know, by unions and the companies played a big part in keeping it going. Well, Mount Lyle started off with big advantages. They believed it was a very rich mine. 
the first mine was called the Iron Blower, the Mount Isle Mine. And they started off mining 5 or 4% copper, and uh, that was very good if mined on a large scale, but that became poorer and poorer. The North Lyle Mine was a fairly rich mine, I suppose, most years it averaged 6% copper, which was very good, but a considerable portion of the ore that's come from that field has been low-grade ore, a lot of it marginal ore. So that the endowment of natural resources is not enough to explain why it's kept going for so long. Do you think that the West Coast spirit might have something to do with this, that the miners realise that without the mine, the whole community yeah. closes down? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think that's realised. I think people, everyone there realises that if you stand on your dignity in times of crisis and demand more than the mine can conceivably pay, well, you're simply putting an end to the town. And likewise, I think at several key periods, uh, the directors have really squandered outside interests in order to pump money into the mine to keep it going at a loss. There seems to be a degree of heart in this operation that doesn't seem to be the case with many other mining operations. Yes, I suppose that's true. For one thing, when I first went there in 1951, there were quite a large number of people over the age of 75 who were still working there. I know one old man was aged 86. He ran a change house in the smelters. I'm not sure whether that was Billy Williams or Joe Williams. No, Joe was his son, who was the barber. Some of the old uh, bosses in the smelters, I suppose they would be you know, over 80, went to work every day. They would have preferred to do that. That was again. their life, yes. They knew of no other existence. They started their working career at the age of 12 or 14 or 16 with a 12-hour day or a 10-hour day, and they had no hobbies outside their work. If they retired, I think that was a great blow to them. Everyone knew there that if the mine were closed, it probably wouldn't reopen and that from time to time sacrifices had to be made uh, both by the company and by the unions in order to keep the place going. Ultimately, they've got to find a new ore body. This low-grade marginal ore body will give them trouble for a long time to come. Always be a green sound, In 1978, the people of Queenstown took to the streets to celebrate the federal government's subsidy to tide the Mount Lyle Company over until world copper prices rose. There are other mining operations on the west coast, of course, recovering iron ore and tin. There may not always be a Queenstown, but the west coast is far from seeing the end of the mining boom that has sustained its settlement from the end of the last century. That was The West Coasters, a documentary prepared and produced by Tim Bowden.